Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast with NBA TV and TNT host and sideline reporter Kristen Ledlow is brought to you in part by Compassion International. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Sponsor a child today. My wife, my daughter, myself, we sponsor a 13-year-old boy from Haiti. We've been doing this for quite a few years now, and it's $38 a month, and it's the best $38 that we spend each and every month. And one of the cool things that we get to do with our child that we sponsor is have direct communication. I get to send them letters. They get to send letters back to us and let us know how they're doing. So on this episode, I wanted to actually read you a portion of the letter from the 13-year-old boy in Haiti as he wrote to us. He said, Dear Jason, good morning, dear supporter. I feel very happy to write you and to greet you in the name of Jesus, who has all power. It's always a pleasure for me every time I have the occasion to write with you. How are you doing? Your health, your activities. As for me, everything is going very well, thanks to God. I am watching the World Cup. How is the World Cup going on for you? What teams are you supporting? Thank you for all your support you give me. Thank you for the love you have for me. Please pray for me so that I stay in God and that I get a good vacation. I just thought that was really neat uh, that I just received this letter uh, as I'm taping this podcast and thought I would read that to you. And that's what compassion's about. It's a direct connection with a child. You provide a child with hope. You provide a child with every essential that they need, that they deserve. Every child deserves your basic necessities. And really what it does is it gives them hope. It releases them from poverty. Over 1.8 million children around the world are being impacted by the great work at Compassion International. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum, $38 a month. Sponsor a child today. Today's guest on the podcast, she is Kristen Ledlow, host and sideline reporter on NBA TV and TNT. You have, of course, seen Kristen on all of the big TNT NBA broadcasts. She also works on the NBA's Inside Stuff with Grant Hill. Kristen started her journey, her broadcasting journey, while she was in college, and she's also a former sports radio co-host on 92.9 The Game and a former field reporter for Fox Sports Next, which was covering SEC and ACC football and basketball and working in Tallahassee. She's also a former Miss Capital City USA in 2012 and placed top five at Miss Florida USA. But Kristen is way more than that. She's a follower of Jesus, and she is someone who lives out her faith. She's not ashamed. And on this episode of the podcast, certainly we talk about the NBA and the summer of 2018, the off season. Does she get any time off? And certainly the big story being LeBron James signing with the Lakers. But for her, it was a really cool summer as well because she got the opportunity to do play-by-play for the first time on NBA Summer League broadcast. So we talked to her about that. We also talk about coming from a small college like Southeastern University in Florida and making it all the way to become an NBA sideline reporter and host. We also talk about her faith and her need and her want to be in a church community and how important that is for her. And of course, we have to talk about her celebrity family feud experience where she had that famous answer at the end that won her team from the NBA uh, and TNT, the celebrity family feud matchup. So it's a lot of fun here. I really liked Kristen because she's just the real deal. And I think you guys will really enjoy hearing from her. So without further ado, let's get right to it. NBA TV and TNT host and sideline reporter Kristen Ledlow joins us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Take a listen. Kristen, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It is great to talk to you. Excited to kind of hear about your journey. And we're taping this in the off season. It's late July, early August, summer 2018. And it, it seems like the sport you now cover is year round, of course, never a dull moment in the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> but you, do you get to enjoy any downtime, I guess, is my question, because it seems like there's news every single day in the NBA. Uh, Training camp begins in September. Do you have any downtime between now and then? (laughs) Yeah, it it doesn't seem like there's an off season anymore for the NBA. Uh, But yes, there is some downtime. End of July, right around now, start of August. So yes, there is a bit of an off off season for us still. That's good. I know LeBron, of course, was the big story 
signing with the Lakers, but there's this woman named Kristen Ledlow who got the opportunity to call play-by-play game <laughs> for the first time at the NBA Summer League broadcast. That looked yeah, really that, cool. I mean, Tell us about that. Easily as big a deal as LeBron being at Summer League, right? <laughs> oh, in right Lakers on. shorts. If you have the right on par. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in, at least in my mind, right? Of course. Uh, I was not rocking Lakers shorts, but uh, <laughs> no, I, it was the coolest thing. And I had brought it up, I guess somewhat jokingly, which you cannot do at Turner Sports because opportunities are endless and they allow you to continue evolving as a broadcaster. So again, I brought it somewhat jokingly to um, the attention of someone who could do something about it uh, during the NBA finals that, you know, hey, I'd love to call a game. And, and how would that actually happen? How would that, that even start? And she said to me, you know, well, we'd start at Summer League. And then, you, again, the conversation was less than a minute. And then I got my schedule that I was going to be calling games. And so wow. it's one of those things that I guess you kind of figure out as you go, because there's no real formula that works every single time for every single person. So it was something that as I went, because I got a chance to call four of them, it got easier and easier and I felt more and more comfortable, but I I mean, I would love to do more of it if the opportunity presented itself for sure. What kind of preparation? I I just, I've been a broadcasting guy. I've been around broadcasting for a long time and I know as a reporter and a host, it's much different than play by play. How, How did you prepare for that? Yeah, it was totally different because what I typically do in a sideline reporting role is try to, in some capacity, further the story of the game. So, you know, the play-by-play broadcaster and the analyst are, are, are kind of telling the story of the game in, in live time as it's happening. And then I try and further that story by telling them something that perhaps Chris Paul told me that morning, or perhaps maybe an, an injury update or just to further, you know, the, the, the rehabilitation update or whatever it is. So sure. I look for stories and I look to try to, to further upon those stories, but in play by play, it was more so, um, it was more so, again, just the, just the live action, what's happening right in front of you right now. Um, and the difficult part of that, especially in a summer league um, you know, arena, is that you don't know their names off the top of your head. Right. <laughs> you know? exactly. like, it almost seems like it would be easier to call a game with all of the guys that I know, even though that would be on a much larger scale. <laughs> Yeah, it was about uh, having the information readily accessible to me, um, who they are, where they went to school, their background, and, and, and to try and, again, incorporate some of that information in some useful way while the game is actually happening in live time. It was something that I have a huge, huge amount of respect now for those guys like Mike Breen and Kevin Harlan and Marv Albert who have to do this on a regular basis with the stakes are much higher, you know, and, and have to keep up with everything that there is to keep up with. That was what I think is what surprised me the most. It's not like with my regular role, telling stories and, and helping to further the story of the game. It was telling the story of the game in live time and, and being on top of that, being almost ahead of that, um, which I'm sure I, I was not most of the time, <laughs> but it was something that I was trying to learn as I went. Absolutely. Now you've been with NBA TV and covering the NBA full time for a few years now. I wonder, because it's always, there's, so, there's sort of that moment when most people can say, okay, that sort of welcome to the big leagues moment when you were like, yeah, this is pretty cool. Look what I get to do. <laughs> do you have that moment? Is there a story you can share? Yeah, it's funny that you bring that up because there is actually a moment that stands out in my mind, my very first season hosting Inside Stuff with Grant, which at this point now was five years ago, which is crazy. Mm, We're all getting old, I guess. (laughs) Uh, Well, Grant was already old. I'm getting old. That's right. Make Um, sure you tell him that too, right? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) But in our very first season, uh, the Miami Heat and San Antonio Spurs were in the NBA Finals at that point, and we went to San Antonio to shoot Inside Stuff live on location. And I had an interview with George Gervin, the Iceman, out on the Riverwalk in San Antonio. And Mm. I don't know that I had really yet to that point kind of soaked in all that was my very first season with NBA TV because it was so much and it had happened so fast. And it all just seemed like a dream that I couldn't believe was a reality. And so when I went uh, to interview him and we got on, we actually, I mean, we did the whole thing, the river walk thing, like you get on the boat and you do the whole round. The, I mean, it was the coolest thing, but as we were on that boat and it's this, you know, 30 or 45 minute 
trip around the, the Riverwalk area, um, all these fans started gathering towards the, the, the banks of the river and, and yelling his name and, and yelling, that's the inside stuff. And I kind of looked up and realized, like, I think not only in that moment that – that, that, that basketball means so much to so many people. But here in this moment, in some small way, I get to be part of the basketball story. And I think that was the first time that it really hit me like, whoa, this is really actually happening. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's not just, you know, the, the dream from the time I was a little girl, which it was, but now it's, it's a reality. And I think that was the very first time that I really looked around and was like, whoa, this is really happening that's very cool we're talking to Kristen ledlow here on the sports spectrum podcast you mentioned sort of that dream as a kid i wonder if 10 year old Kristen ledlow <laughs> knew that someday she'd be interviewing world famous nba players as part of your dream when you were a kid is that what it was uh, well she wanted to um <laughs> Uh, the, the WNBA actually came into existence when I was about nine years old. Um, and so up to that point, you know, as I had started playing basketball as a little girl, um, it was my dream, and I quote, to be the first woman to play in the NBA. I love it. <laughs> and I had written that down in many places and had done book reports about it and, and had uh, showed up as Michael Jordan for your, your role model day. And, you know, that was it was. It it was everything to me from the time I was very young, um, primarily because I was as tall as I am now by the time I was about 12, <laughs> except about 60 pounds lighter. So it's like, what in the world is a kid that's this tall, this awkward, this out of place going to do to find a, a space to really to fit in and to thrive? And the basketball court is always where I felt like I was I was that and, and I was good and I was good at this one thing. And it was, it was just something that I fell in love with from the time that I was very young. So I didn't know exactly what it would look like. I can't sit here and tell you that, you know, eight, nine, 10 year old Kristen thought I'd be, you know, <laughs> standing on the <laughs> sidelines on TNT talking to LeBron James on a weekly basis. I, but I did want to work in or around the sport for good. I didn't know if that would be teaching or coaching. And then as I got older, I thought maybe it would be within an NBA franchise's front office or perhaps in PR or marketing, or I just wanted to work in or around the sport in some way. I didn't know exactly what it would look like, but I have been in love with basketball from the time I was very, very young. Now, I know your faith is also an important part of your life. Tell me about faith growing up. Was that a part of who Kristen was in the Ledlow family? Yeah. And I think that that was one of the reasons why I grew up with this kind of irrational thought that I actually could do anything. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It was because I was told that from the time I was very young, um, you know, that I could be anytime I dreamed of being the first or the only that I could. And, um, and yeah, I grew up in an incredible Christian home where I was um, just continually encouraged in my faith and, and encouraged also to, to thrive in my own lane and to pursue excellence and to follow through, which all sound like kind of basketball cliches, but are also very much life lessons. Um, I, I had a ring actually on my finger for most of my childhood and then into my adult life uh, until people started asking me who I was married to um, that said <laughs> follow through. And it was from my dad. And, and um, again, it's, it's, you know, it's in free throws, but it's also in life. And, and so, yes, uh, my, my childhood was, was defined by, well, I think probably my parents' faith, but ultimately it became my own as, as I grew up and, and began to pursue it for myself. When did that moment take place for you? I talk about moments a lot on this podcast, certainly the moment when, you know, you mentioned that welcome to the NBA moment. What was the moment for you? Was it in college, high school, when you realized, okay, that's my parents' faith. This has to become mine. That for me was in college. Um, I grew up in Tallahassee and I spent the first part of my college career at Florida State. And for me, it was a decision that was based on comfort, uh, not necessarily based on confidence in any capacity. Um, and, and it's an incredible school. And I've gotten a chance to do a lot of work there. And my, my career actually started on campus at Florida State. But again, I, I made that decision because so many in my high school class did as well. Uh, in order to not have to move on, in order to not have to step out, and in, in order to not have to display any level of confidence in 
the next step in my journey. Um, and so for me, it actually was during my freshman year at Florida State. And I remember very vividly sitting inside of what was a gathering of student athletes and the man who was, uh, you know, sharing a message, sharing his message of faith, uh, spoke very personally into my life, both during the message and then afterwards as well. And he was very, is blunt the right word in saying sure. that if I had made a decision out of comfort, that, that I, I had to be willing to, to step out in faith. And within actually just a few days, I, um, decided that I was going to, to move on to Southeastern university, which is also a Christian university. Um, and, and again, it's, it's not that, that I couldn't have, you know, found or experienced Jesus at Florida State as opposed to Southeastern or vice versa or anywhere because he is all of everywhere. But for me, it was more so about stepping out of the comfort zone of Tallahassee, of everyone that I had known and everyone that I had grown up around, and instead stepping into what could be the next season of my own life. And and it ended up changing not only my own life significantly, but the the career that I ended up stepping into because it was a smaller school. I was able from the time I was a freshman uh, down at Southeastern. I transferred immediately, by the way. <laughs> um, I was able from the time I was a freshman um, step into a space that I felt so overwhelmingly comfortable in, and that was our broadcast studio. And I fell in love with the broadcasting side of basketball while I was playing the sport. And then I started playing volleyball there as well. And because of that decision, because of, again, just the the the, the leap of faith, which as, you know, an 18-year-old seems like the, the most giant one you can possibly take is that of moving away from your hometown and transferring schools to one where you know nobody else. Um, but for me, that was, it was instrumental in, in my life, in my career, and in my walk with God, because again, it was something that I did on my own and by myself. And as I uh, went to Southeastern and even got down onto campus there, it was something that, that I could physically feel from the inside of who I was, that I was able to breathe deeper than I had before, that I was able to um, step more confidently than I had been able to before. And it wasn't necessarily some flash, you know, from heaven, we talk about come to Jesus moments. Yeah. It was actually, it was a come to Jesus season, you know, and, and learning just to continue stepping to, to continue being bold. And, and I learned how to do that as a college student, which again, I believe could have happened anywhere, but for me, that's where it happened. Now, Southeastern, no offense to any of the people who went to Southeastern, it's not <laughs> the Syracuse or Northwesterns of the world where a no. lot of the broadcast people come from. So how does one go from Southeastern to interviewing <laughs> LeBron James at the All-Star Game or going and working for TNT? Take us through that journey. Goodness. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question because I, I think first and foremost, it is because God's dreams are significantly bigger for me than mine have ever been for myself. And he does such a spectacular job of taking care of the details that we probably would not have been able to figure out on our own. Um, but but I, I stepped into, like I said, that broadcasting space from the time that I was a freshman. I was able to uh, be part of you know, local on-air broadcast, I was able to, to learn how to, to write and to edit and to produce and to, and to shoot my own stuff. And, and again, the same way that I talk about having found my faith there as opposed to anywhere else, I do think also that, that students have an opportunity to create a special career for themselves anywhere. And, it, and it's, it's, it's upon the student, not, not necessarily the organization um, sure. to, to do so. But like you said, Southeastern is not known for its television personalities. <laughs> so, so it was, um, you know, it was a lot of networking that I did outside of Southeastern's walls. It was being willing to, for example, uh, when the, the Super Bowl was in Tampa, I drove from Lakeland to Tampa just to wait in the hotel lobby of one of the ESPN producers that I had been told would give me five or so minutes of his time to be able to give me a little bit of advice. And then fast forward a couple of years later, he gave me my first internship. And so it was little things that, that now that I look back and realize 
wow, that, that all kind of fit together. It was like all these little pieces of a puzzle that ultimately became this beautiful picture that, again, at 30, it's a lot easier to look back and say, oh, well, of course, I did this at 18 and this at 19, and just have faith, and it, you'll get there. It, it's not easy then, of course, and, and those, kind of, those kind of things don't seem like they may necessarily end up being worth it, but as I look back now and as I reflect on it now, um, it's, it, it, they absolutely were. So it was things like that. It was I chose to intern more than once while I was a student. I uh, was very purposeful about networking, again, outside of Southeastern's walls. I was then, again, very purposeful about doing the same thing every single time that I went home, which, of course, was and still is Tallahassee. Uh, I, I would go home for Christmas breaks or Thanksgiving breaks or spring breaks and and look to shadow local broadcasters and, and look to get in the door anywhere that I could because I had been told, um, you know, over and over that that again it was it was less about what I was going to know in college and more about who I was going to know within the industry and so I was very purposeful as a student um in branching out to uh, really anyone that that could could help me in any way uh, learn a little bit more or or get my foot in the door and I was willing to to really do anything as well, which I think a lot of students miss. And when I talk to a lot of young women, uh, young men and young women, actually, that are students and looking to get started, they want to skip over that part where you're behind the scenes and the work is a little harder and nobody's taking care of everything that you, you, you need for a broadcast the way that they do ultimately down the road. But those are the things that I very purposefully stepped into um, solely because I knew where I wanted to be long term. And those, I think, uh, were the most important steps in what ultimately became a career, um, you know, that, that, that I have now at, at 30. But those were supremely important steps. And I think that that would be one of the things that, that I would tell, you know, students as they're, as they're in that space now trying to figure out how to get started. It's just not to neglect the little things, not to shy away from the seemingly small, not to try and rush past, um, you know, the season of life where maybe nobody's watching yet. Because again, as I look back now on all of those puzzle pieces that kind of fit together to to become this, those were the most important. Those were the most important steps, the seemingly small steps. Do you remember that first time you got that call from NBA TV for that first job and what that was like? Oh, well, I remember it specifically because I had auditioned for Inside Stuff solely because, and I am not kidding when I tell you this, I just wanted to meet Grant Hill for the day. That's awesome. Um, and, I, and so I, I asked everybody that I knew that had anything to do with it, if I could just get an audition because I thought that would be awesome just to meet Grant Hill for the day. That'll roll. And everyone was like, don't hug him, like be normal. And I was like, I'm going <laughs> to hug him. You know, like, so, so, so yeah, I mean, I had gone in really just thinking, okay, I'm just going to have a great time today. I get to be inside that studio. Yeah, I mean, come on, everybody knows the NBA TV and TNT studio, like just to be able to get to be there and get to meet Grant and get to walk through that studio, I thought that will be the coolest day. So I begged for an opportunity to do so, and they allowed me to be the last audition of the day. Um, so I just went in there and thought, you know, I'm going to have a great time, and I hadn't heard anything back for a couple of weeks. I remember, though, the call specifically because I had the flu, and I was coming out of a walk-in clinic trying to get, you know, better, and got into my car and looked at my phone, and I had a couple of missed calls, and I'm like, wait a second. And I ended up calling back and they said that they had uh, narrowed it down to a couple of people, um, you know, for the inside stuff hosting role and that I was their first choice. And if I wanted it, the job would be mine. And I think I pulled it together. I don't know. I'd probably have to ask them now if I, because I think I very, I, I played it off pretty cool. Like, you know, thank you for the opportunity. I'll see you soon. You know, and then hung yeah, up the phone. Let me get back to you. Right. right. And, and it was like so much. She's like, I, I, I'm sobbing, but I'm also burning hot because I have the flu. I, you know, I have to call my parents. I'm like, I got that job, the one, you know, with Grant, you know. And so, yes, I remember that day <laughs> like it was yesterday. And again, it's crazy because it was, I guess, more than five years ago now. But it was such a significant moment for me, not just because of having the flu, but because it was a, you know, a life altering phone call. So, yeah, it was it was a very memorable and very special moment. Talking to Kristen Ledlow here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Tell me about 
now that you've been in this role a little bit, about living out your faith. You know, we can't obviously walk into our jobs with big crosses on our shirts and Bibles and telling people what they need to believe, but yet we're still called to, you know, go and make disciples and to live out our faith uh, as Christians. So how do you do that every day, especially as a public figure and someone who's on TV and, and working NBA games? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, I want to always work excellently. That was a lesson that was taught to me by my college volleyball coach at Southeastern, Terry Thomas. He, he taught us that every single day, like this is your offering. That's, that's the way that he described volleyball practice. It's the way that he described preseason conditioning. It's that you have been given this gift. What is it that you're going to do to hone it excellently so that it becomes your offering? Mm -hmm. And that was a, a life altering lesson for me because again as i now step into these these spaces that are that are much bigger than the seemingly small ones while i was at southeastern while i learned those lessons it again has been life altering to to decide every single day that i am going to do this one job excellently that this one thing that i've been given and the platform that i'm now standing on because of it is going to ultimately be my offering and again one of the life altering lessons that i've learned came from Ernie Johnson, who, as everyone knows, is, you know, the, the, our face of TNT, I guess, well, maybe the Charles best. is, yeah. I don't know, but Ernie is the <laughs> best that there is. And, and Ernie told me a couple of years ago that his life was changed as a, 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 a believer in the business um, when he decided that it was no longer about changing the lives of the millions of people that were watching every night and instead about changing the lives of just the three men that he was sitting next to. And, and he said that that, that perspective shift ultimately changed the way that he looked at his calling in, in this industry. And so I've tried to do the same ever since Ernie told me that it's like, okay, instead of trying to impact again, the millions of people who may be watching what I say about basketball on television, instead it's about the, the men and women alongside me in these rooms every single day, because we spend a lot more time off of television together than we do on television. And so the opportunity to be in rooms with men and women who are as influential as they are and are shaping our society, are, are helping to transform our culture. To have a small voice in a room like that is, I think, all I could, no, it's, it's far more than I could have ever asked for. And, and that, for me, has become my focus. Kristen Ledlow joins us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. You also got to spend a lot of time recently with your MBA cohorts on Celebrity Family Feud. I mean, <laughs> come on now. And yes, you won. Share with us a fun story yeah. and just what that experience was like. Well, first of all, I don't think anyone had expected us to win. Okay. <laughs> so we're on the bus. On the, we, we all rode on a bus together to actually film this thing. And I mean, you know the team, all right? We're not exactly bright and quick thinkers. Okay. <laughs> and all that family feud is, is, you know, being bright and being a quick thinker. So we're all kind of thinking, all right, we'll go and have a good time. But the likelihood is that we're not sharp enough to beat another team in a game of thought. <laughs> so we all kind of go there thinking it'll be a good time. And so we spend hours there and at the, well, it's one of those things that, you know, it's like, it's like a bucket list moment, you know, because you watch that show every single, you know, Tuesday morning when you're sick and at home, you get a chance to watch Family Feud. It's all kind of part of it, part of growing up. And so to get to be there and to get to hear the music and see the lights, I was so excited about that just from the get go. But then as we get closer and closer and I realize wow, we actually, we, we have a real shot here. Like we're, we're actually doing well, you know? <laughs> and, and I know that not only is the audience kind of rooting for us, not that they wouldn't root for the MLB all-stars, but everybody's rooting for Shaq and Charles to do the fast money round. I mean, that's what America wants to see is to see how fast or not fast those guys can come up with answers. <laughs> so, so as we get closer and closer. It's, goodness, we have an actual opportunity to win this thing. And then it came down to what was the the head-to-head the -head showdown for us to be able to have a chance at going to the big money round. And it came down to me. And of course, the one answer that has now become infamous is what's <laughs> sold in a pack of six. And I nail the answer with beer and Shaq and Charles go on to win the rest of the thing. But you know what's funny is I've done this job now for, I'm about to enter my sixth season in the role that I've been in with NBA TV and TNT. And 
I don't think that anyone has talked to me about my job as much as people have talked to me about Family Feud in the last like month and a half since it aired. Like I'm talking the church parking lot. I'm talking the grocery store. Everywhere I go, people want to talk to me about Family Feud. So it was, I, I mean, goodness, I could go on. As you can tell, I could go on about it for an hour and a half solely about Celebrity Family Feud. But it was one of the most fun days of my career, really in my life thus far. You mentioned church parking lot. I know you belong to a church in Atlanta. How does it having that church community uh, how has it helped you, I guess, in your journey, just in life, having that church community and belonging to a church? Oh, I, I could say that it's a game changer, but I think that would be downplaying how significant my community of people here has been. It's a life changer. Um, in the lowest moments of my life, it's given me someone that I could call. In the highest moments, celebratory moments of my life and in my career, it's it's giving me community to celebrate alongside. You know, it, they've they've given me accountability, they've given me encouragement, they've continued to help me align my 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 mind and heart with truth in a world that is always combating for the opposite. And so to be able to be um to be strengthened by a community that I'm surrounded by, to be just for my, I mean, I, I would hate to say that my strength comes from them because it doesn't. It comes from the God that we're serving. But to be able to, to be continually pointed back to him by the people I'm surrounded by has, again, not just been game changing. It's been life changing. How do you kind of stay filled with in a church community during an NBA season? Because obviously you're traveling a lot and you're doing games. Yeah, it's not an easy thing because I'm not able a lot of times to be able to be actually at a service on a Sunday morning in right. Atlanta because there are so many times that I'm not either – in Atlanta or awake, you know, I mean, right. there, there are so many times that it just simply isn't part of the schedule, but because of being so invested in the community, it allows me, um, those relationships, even while I'm on the road. So again, that's been a huge part of it. It's not simply going into a church's walls or into a church building that is, is ultimately life changing. It's, it's, investing in the people that are inside. It's investing in a common purpose, a purpose that is not circumstantial. And so while the circumstances of my NBA season change as months, you know, turn into now years of doing this job, a common purpose is not circumstantial. And thus the community, those relationships, th that's what has helped define this season of my life, not a, an NBA season. It's, it's the season of my life that's been defined by these people and by, you know, the people inside of the church walls, not the church walls itself. And, and I may have told you before, but we'll gladly tell the audience the way that I found those people in the very first place was by moving into the very first apartment that I had in Atlanta <laughs> and simply Googling the closest church building to me. Cause I kind of thought, well, I'm an adult now. I should probably get up at a decent hour on a Sunday and, and head on out <laughs> to church on my own. You know, yeah. like, that's, that's, just, that's a mark of adulthood, right? That you yeah. do it by yourself. Um, <laughs> and, and so I, just by, you know, simply Googling where it was that I was going to wake up and go to that in and of itself would not have been what marked this season of my life. It was choosing to keep going back. It was choosing to invest in the people there and allowing them to, to, to dive into my life and invest in mine as well. So again, I, I keep going back to the very cliche. It's not a game changer. It's a life changer, but it has been, it's, it's been a, a people that, have marked this season of my life because of a common purpose, because of a common goal, because of a purpose that is not circumstantial, but despite so much of my life being so. And yet struggles still come. We all have them in our lives. Can you talk about some of those struggles, maybe challenges, I should say, that you face spiritually as a, as a public figure, just being someone who people recognize on TV and watch on television? Well, it's a difficult thing because we haven't created a culture that highly values truth. Mm. We haven't created a culture that decides to celebrate others and keep them celebrated. We've created a culture that instead builds others up solely in order to tear them down and watch the show. So to be part of not only a culture that does so, but to be one of the few people that has been celebrated to an extent and then, as many have seen, ha have hit very 
very low moments publicly, you know, that then I have to navigate through while all of these hundreds turn into thousands, turn into the millions of people have an opinion on it. Um, it's by no means an easy thing. Um, it comes back to first and foremost community. It comes back to, it comes back to community pointing you to truth because first and foremost, it's truth. And it's not an easy thing, like I said, to navigate a position within our culture that does not highly value truth, but it's about coming back to it over and over and over again. When, when the highs come and they are temporary, when the lows come and they are also temporary, it's about continually aligning my mind and heart with that truth. Yeah. You're in a business too, where, um, you know, it's played basketball is play by guys, at least from the NBA perspective that you cover so much of what your work is. How difficult for you is it being a woman in the broadcasting business. It's interesting because when I was little, um, there were very few women to look up in, look up to in the basketball space. Mm. Um, you know, the, the WNBA is only in its what two decades of existence at this point. When I was a little girl, it wasn't even realistic to think maybe I could play professional basketball one day. Um, and so there are unique challenges, unique hurdles still for women who are blazing these trails in the game and in the story of basketball. But it's also such a unique and special time to be a woman in the game. Because when I was little, I said it, there were very few that you could even watch. And even so, they were relegated to certain roles and, and weren't able to, to navigate you know, the walls outside of them. But instead now, if I'm a little girl and I go to a basketball game, I know, okay, I can play in this game. I can call this game. I can be a referee for this game. I can be on the coaching staff for this game. I can be a sideline reporter at this game. Uh, I could be an analyst for this game. There are so many now unique avenues that, that women not only have the ability to take, but have created because of the opportunities that have been afforded and because of the incredible and, and bright and beautiful beautiful women who have blazed those trails before me. So I think even a few years ago, I would have answered that question differently. And there are still, like I said, unique hurdles, unique challenges to be able to, to, to walk through as a woman in a male dominated industry. But it's also such an exciting time to be part of the first wave of women who are part of the basketball story. Yeah. And you get to impart that wisdom now to the my daughter's 14 to that, you know, 14 year old Sarah Romano, my daughter (laughs) Uh and tell her, Hey, you know what? This is going to be even different when you're here in 10 years, right? Oh yeah. Well, it's, it's been entirely different even in the 10 years that I've been in this business. I'm actually about to enter my 10th year in the sports broadcasting industry. And Mm -hmm. so even to watch it from the start of where I was, where it was when I started until now, you know, set aside what was the opportunity for me when I was a little girl. Again, it was even, it was much fewer and further between then. Even 10 years ago, it was still, there were roles that women were relegated to and were not typically able to step outside of those. Now you don't find that as the case. It's, it's still about helping to normalize it and helping a sports audience get used to not only seeing a woman referee an NBA game, but a woman on the sidelines and a woman analyzing the game and calling the game. It's still about having women in these roles long enough and often enough and at a high enough level that, that the, the audience accepts it and celebrates it ultimately, but still so much has changed even just in the 10 years that I've been in the business. So in the 10 years between your 14 year old daughter Mm -hmm. becoming what a 24 year old, which is where I, you know, that was the first couple of years of my career where I was starting out as well. I would only imagine that the women alongside of me and even in front of me will have made so much more headway by then that the opportunities will be unlimited. I know giving back and charity is so important. Obviously, we just talked about that in terms of giving back, but you're involved in the women's ministry in your church. You blended your voice to the End It movement and bringing awareness to sex trafficking and slavery. Why is that important for you to be involved and lend your voice to good causes? Yeah, it's important for me, especially in those avenues. Um, The 
women's ministry at our church and the end it movement. Preemptive love is another that I've been able to be involved with um, both financially and then also to helping to um, promote them, you know, publicly. And I try to do the same with, with each of these organizations solely because I want to, while I have a voice and for some reason there are hundreds of thousands of people listening to it right now. Um, I want to be a voice for those who are voiceless. I want to be able to shine a light in the dark places because I know it has been done for me. I want to be able to speak up for those who can't or won't. Um, and I want to be able to, to leverage the position that I have been handed because by no means do I ever forget that it's been handed to me. I want to be able to leverage the position I've been handed um, to be able to help change the culture we've created to be able to help, um, like I said, you know, reach those, those places and those people who, who desperately need reaching. Um, and, and again, while I have this platform and the ability to encourage others to be involved as well, I want to take advantage of it. It's been really great catching up with you, Kristen Ledlow. Final question here. And we have, we asked this to pretty much all of our guests on the podcast. It's not an easy answer. It's a very easy question sometimes, but in this season of life where God has you right now, what are you learning from him? What is the Lord teaching you right now? I am learning in this season of my life. Oh, goodness. Hmm. Um, First and foremost, that time is not a sufficient healer, that our souls need healing that goes far beyond waking up and going to sleep every single day, and that it is absolutely worth the fearless pursuit of all that God has called each of us to, that that his dreams for us are far greater than our dreams for ourselves, that he navigates through the details and, and, and sets us up for so much more, um, but that it's worth the fearless pursuit of going from fearful too fearless, that, it, that it's worth the, the hard and the heavy and the healing. It is worth all of those things. Every single step is worth, um, is worth it in this journey towards fearlessness, that it's, it's not just about, again, hoping that enough time passes, but instead being purposeful about the healing that is there and ultimately stepping into all that God has for us, for me. That's what I'm walking through. That's what I'm navigating right now, even as we speak. She is Kristen Ledlow, host and sideline reporter on NBA TV and TNT. Of course, you see her on the NBA's Inside Stuff with Grant Hill. This has been really cool to to talk to you, Kristen. Really appreciate your your honesty and and walking through your journey and I wish you nothing but the best. Thanks for joining us. Thank you again for having me. And we do thank Kristen Ledlow, NBA TV and TNT sideline reporter and host for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. You can follow Kristen on Twitter at Kristen Ledlow, and of course, she's active on Instagram too, and check her out. She's awesome. She's just a a cool person. I love that she's um, so open about her faith, and I love that she's just enjoying herself. You can tell that she has fun. I mean, how can you not have fun working on the NBA broadcast covering the NBA on TNT and NBA TV? So again, we really appreciate Kristen for being here and joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. We also appreciate Compassion International for being our sponsor. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum, $38 a month. You can sponsor a child and help release a child from poverty in Jesus' name. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum Sponsor a child today. You won't regret it. I promise you that. $38 a month, the best $38 you will spend every single month. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Sponsor a child today. Thanks so much for joining us here on the podcast. You can email me directly, jason at sportspectrum.com. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, of course, our YouTube channel, and all of our content found over at sportspectrum.com. Dot com, where you can get a daily devotional every single morning at 6 a.m. over at sportspectrum.com. Thanks so much for listening to this podcast. We'll see you next time right here on Sports Spectrum. Have a great day.